Good morning and welcome to our video, Playing with Blocks. If you don't know me, my name is Liz McCaw. I am a Reggio-inspired uh, kindergarten teacher and I have a master's in early learning. Um, I've studied kindergarten through coursework and I've also worked as an early learning educator. And I've been thinking a lot about block play as I observe my students and as I've purchased blocks for my one-year-old granddaughter and I wanted to share some of my thinking and some of my learning around block play. As a Reggio inspired teacher we spend a lot of our program on play. I spend a lot of time nurturing relationships with the children and I also spend a lot of time building our classroom community. Loris Malaguzzi was part of the Reggio Emilia development after World War II in Italy. And this is a quote from him. There are three teachers of children, adults, other children, and the environment. And so today we're going to talk about blocks in the environment from a Reggio-inspired educator lens. Now many early childhood educators, myself included, believe that every early learning classroom should have a full set of hardwood blocks. Now if I had my druthers, I'd have a classroom in each school filled with thousands of blocks, much like we have a music room or a library that children would come as a class and play in this classroom. I think it's important to have uh, complementary loose parts in your block center. And this can include figures, cars, signs, animals, containers, and fabric. And I love to link my loose parts to the interests of the children I'm working with. I make sure that I have open shelving so the children can see the blocks and a large uh, floor space with a stable surface so that the children can spread out and build alongside each other or together without knocking the structures down. And as a Reggio inspired educator, I provide my learners with ample time to play and we'll talk about that later in the video. 10 reasons to add block play. There are many, many reasons to add block play to your playroom or to your classroom, but these are the 10 that speak to me. And the first one is relationships. Um, adding block play to your classroom provides an opportunity for children to get to know each other as they learn to play together and share their interests and their skills and learn to support each other. You're actually building relationships amongst the children and also setting the tone for your classroom community. In our classroom, our biggest goal is to use kindness. And when we say use kindness, it really overlaps and um, is revealed through the way the children talk to each other, play together, share resources, listen to each other, and compromise with each other. And so it's one of my top five goals relationships and community because I know I want to create an environment where the students feel safe and welcomed and that it's their space. We're seeing a delay in spatial skills amongst children who come to kindergarten and so block play is a perfect opportunity for those children to work on one-to-one -one correspondence, eye-hand coordination, um, being able to visualize how they're going to make a row of blocks to create a roadway or being able to visualize what will their parking lot look like. Because blocks are an open-ended material and I include open-ended materials along with my blocks, it's an op opportunity for children to express their creativity. To Look at the beautiful block sample from Pickle Bums which is um, a home-based blog and you can see that their child has created quite an extensive um, environment with his blocks. He's got his warrior figures, he's got an as assembly of different kinds of blocks, table blocks, he's got some loose parts with some lids and some cans and some recycled discs, he's got some nature blocks, some wooden blocks, some jewels to decorate, and so he's able to express his creativity and use his imagination. And I can only imagine 
This went on for quite some time, or he may have revisited it over time. There's a lot of problem solving and decision making that goes into block play. As the children decide, I want to make a path, I have this much space, which blocks are the best fit? I want my path to be up, raised in the air, and then to step down, how will I do that? I want to create an enclosure around my castle uh, to protect my warriors from dinosaurs that are roaming around. And so as they're creating and building, they're solving problems and making decisions the whole time. And this is especially evident if they're playing with a sibling or a peer, because then they have to learn to listen to each other and to share ideas and to compromise and to deal with upsets that will naturally happen. And we want to create opportunities where children can develop those social emotional skills they need to solve problems peacefully, to deal with disappointment. As the children are exploring block play and loose parts, the language is emerging as the children learn to describe their thinking and share their feelings and offer suggestions. How about we do this? What if we do this? I like that. I like what you're doing. Can we make it taller? We need more floor space. What other materials could we use? We've run out of discs. Could we use some of mirrors from the story play? Oh, I see some cans on the shelf. How can we use cans to go higher? You can use loose parts to supplement the materials that you have. So for a long time, I had two shelves of large um, clean cans that the children used in the block play. And as time went on and we acquired more blocks, those cans went over to another part of the classroom and were integrated into story play. Now, there are lots of documents posted, lots of PDFs, lots of blog posts on the stages of block play. And these are the six that I got from Fairy Dust Teaching um, that I tend to look for as an observer of children. If you're interested in reading the descriptors of block play, you can click the link on this page and you'll find a PDF with very uh, much more extensive descriptions of what each stage looks like. Our granddaughter is 13 months old and right now she is in the exploration stage and she's just received her first set of blocks. So we've given her six blocks that are rectangles and they're the perfect size for her to carry and hold in her hand. And these are table blocks and so as she learns to explore the blocks, we'll slowly add more. So right now she's carrying one in each hand and she's walking around her playroom. She's got a little um, basket that she likes to fill. So she's doing lots of filling and dumping with the blocks. Um, she's lining them up and just ex generally exploring them. And as time goes on, as her interest grows, we'll add to her block collection um, to nurture the growth of the stages. Now we made our first set of blocks when our daughter was 10 months old. I knew then that I would need a much larger and extensive collection for my new classroom. I was a new kindergarten teacher and this was about 23 years ago. And so I knew then that my um, employer wouldn't be able to budget for a large collection. And so I planned a budget to purchase my materials over time. I had empty shelves for many years. But having a budget made sure that I did not need to compromise. I knew the blocks that I purchased would last the length of my career. That the company offered a variety of wooden shapes. I used inquiry grants like the NOI here in North America to access funding for blocks. Recently, we've had access to funding for teacher practice through our teacher union. And so I've used some of that funding to purchase additional loose parts to complement our block play. And because it's promoting teacher shift in practice, if I relocate to a new school, those materials will come with me to support my program. I always recommend establishing a timeline. I began with a supplemental set, which was around $250 at the time.
And then I shop the annual sales. I receive free shipping, a discount on the cost of my blocks, and each year I would add to my collection. I shop Home Depot for MDF boards, and they actually will cut the MDF board to size for free. And that's a free service they offer anyone. And that enabled my students to build up with the unit blocks. Now, when you're designing your playroom or designing your classroom to accommodate blocks, begin with the idea of what will it look like in two or three years so they don't have to keep redesigning my space. I always begin my room design on paper and I use sticky notes. I draw out the fixed elements like built-in cupboards, doorways, sinks, and windows. And then I use the sticky notes to move the unfixed elements around until I feel comfortable that I've got a really um, well-designed space. I've been intentional about where my blocks are going to go and how that space is going to be used by my learner. I think about the age of my learners and what I know about expected interests as they move into my kindergarten classroom. You want children to be able to build near each other and still have enough space so they don't knock down each other's structures as they move around. You want enough shelving that the children know where the blocks go and so that the blocks can be spaced out. So I have in my classroom um, some built-in blocks under the windows where our block carpet is, but I also have two freestanding bookshelves, one that holds accompanying loose parts like gem blocks and rubber animals and tunnels, and the other one will hold um, our curved blocks, our cones, um, additional blocks, and I want the children to be able to see the blocks at a glance and know exactly where they go when it's cleanup time. If you want to promote complex play, then having only blocks and complementary loose parts in the area encourages this type of play. This means that other materials like magnet tiles should be placed in another area. I actually have two carpets to support block play. One is dedicated to block play, and the second is for quieter centers like reading, story play, stuffy games and magnet tiles and so on. And this way, if the children are building with complex imaginative designs, we can le actually leave the block play from the morning and the children can revisit it in the afternoon. If they build it in the afternoon, they can leave it overnight and revisit their designs in the morning. And this means they can add on to their design, they can finish their design or they can do a redesign and take it apart and rebuild it. I start my year with loose parts in two areas, my math area and my block center. And usually these shelves are not full at the beginning of the year because we want children to be able to learn how to use loose blocks. You wanna create a classroom or a playroom culture where the children work together to clean up when they're finished their play. So you don't want to overwhelm them with too many selections. I like to add loose parts that I know of, are of interest to my students or will support a schema that I've observed, like enclosures. I refresh the loose parts to reflect their interests. Um, perhaps we're doing a guided inquiry on forests and so I'll add some loose parts that will um, invite the children to recreate their forest play. I might add some new loose parts to expand play opportunities for the children. So instead of having three tubes, I might add 10 tubes. I might add tubes of different thicknesses and heights and lengths. What's your role in block play? As a regio inspired teacher, a lot of our time is spent in observing the children, noticing their thinking and their language and their designs, helping them to um, solve problems peacefully, paraphrasing their language, really personalizing their learning program. If you want to learn more about your role in block play, I've included a short link, and so you just follow the link and you can watch another video on block play and the teacher's role. 
Some additional roles of the teacher are to actually do the room design planning, um, design, organizing materials, and purchasing materials for the space. I'm always intentional in my decisions, whether it was when my daughters were young or as an educator. Important components uh, for a teacher role include honing your observation skills. Now, if you're an early learning educator, um, you've had some training in this and you're probably really awesome at it already. But if you haven't spent a lot of time observing children at play, um, there's lots of resources out there for you. And a lot of it is just practice and being intentional. Who am I going to observe? What am I looking for? How can I take my learning and bounce it back to the child through an invitation, a provocation, or bringing in new resources to the classroom to better meet their needs and interests? I have a set of open-ended questions. I don't like to interrupt their play with a lot of questions, so I'll interrupt them only um, at select times, and I want to make sure that my questions are open-ended and not closed. I don't want the student trying to think of what is she really trying to learn from me? What can I say uh, to please her? And so I actually have a wonderful set of open-ended questions on my clipboard that I got from Joanne Babilis at Transforming Ed. And she's got lots of excellent resources for educators and parents at her Instagram site or at her blog. And I would recommend paying her a visit. Now, as a nature educator, I alternate off-site and on-site mornings. And I do this so that my students can have large, uninterrupted time to play with, their, with each other or on their own. So in both programs, I have a minimum of 80 minutes for play. I also have about 40 minutes for guided play. And this is our soft start. And this is when the children might work on math concepts, literacy concepts, uh, story play, working on story concepts. We always begin our on-site day with a soft start and then transition to circle time. This includes songs, movements, and stories. Then the children move on to self-directed play. The next transition, we return to circle time for a shorter time, uh, just rereading favorite stories, singing favorite songs, and then the children flow to lunch. On an off-site morning, we enter the classroom around 10.30. So we've already been at school over two hours. And this is when the children have another soft start. So they'll move from the soft start to a circle time to eating lunch because we've already had our exploration time off-site. I always recommend organizing a collection of interesting photos to inspire your students or child to build different structures. This is the CN Tower in Toronto and here's um, a structure built by visiting grade one students. And that was the first thing they did was look at the poster cards and decide which of these would I like to integrate into my play plan. Thanks for stopping by. I hope that you're inspired to reflect upon your program, your daily flow, or your child's playroom. The photos with children are found on the internet as I choose not to use my students for public slideshows. I try to include the name of the creator of the photos. So you'll see at Community Playthings or at um, Nature Play on Vancouver Island um, so that you can look for those providers for, for more photos on their block play. If you'd like to follow me on Instagram, I've included a link for you. Thanks for stopping by. I hope that today's short video um, inspires you or answers any questions that you have. Thank you.